Well, hi everyone, great to see you here. It's a really fascinating topic. We're going to leap straight into it because uh, time is of the essence. So where, where do we find satisfaction and a sense of the good life? Uh, what sort of life makes us happy? Uh, happiness is a topic that's been on the minds of Australians for some time, especially in the last 10 years or so. It's had a lot of attention. There was an article in the Sydney Morning Herald this morning, in fact, about happiness and Ross has written a lot about this topic, so let me, let me jump in and introduce our panel who are going to be talking about this uh, topic from different perspectives. Ross Gittins is well known to most of us. He's been the economics editor at the Sydney Morning Herald for over 30 years now. Ross, <laughs> that's worth a reward of some sort. Um, <laughs> he's written a number of books, including Gittinomics, The Happy Economist, and Gittins' Gospel. Uh, which is his latest book. Uh, Mark McCrindle, uh, on the end of the panel here, is a social researcher with uh, an international reputation for tracking emerging social trends and other things. And Thupkin Cherki is a Buddhist nun and international director of Liberation Prison Project and the spiritual program coordinator and teacher at the Vajrayana Institute in Sydney and is connected to the Happiness Conference, which is a very large event in both Sydney and Melbourne. So welcome to all of you. Let's jump straight in. Mark, I want to ask you the first question, uh, which can then we can sort of bounce off. But are Australians happy from mm. your research? Is that, you yeah, that? Well, Australians are. Um, that uh, report that was cited in the invitation, the Better Life Index study the OECD ran in May, shows that we're the number one nation out of all the OECD nations on that study. Now, it's a bit broader than just happiness, the, the index that they look at, but, and we're up from third position a few years ago, so you know that's good going. Um, we've conducted our own studies in this area early in the year and we found that 91% of Australians say that they are happy to some extent. You've got 44% of them saying they're very or significantly happy, but 9 in 10 of us to some extent are reporting happiness. Although we also asked the question, are Australians happier today than we were five years ago? And the majority, 54%, said no we're not. We're actually a little bit happier back then than we are now. So there's some sense of maybe some fragmentation in that area, but overall we are. And when we've asked Australians, well, what is the, the basis of this happiness? Why are we at the top of these rankings? Why are we a happy nation? It comes down to three key areas. The first is the lifestyle. People always will cite that as Australians. It's a, it's a relaxed, it's a no worries sort of lifestyle we've got. The second area cited is the climate and the landscape. So, you know, we've got good weather here and nice place. Uh, and then the third comes down to our community. So we, we, we get on pretty well. Um, so to answer the question, are Australians happy? Yes. One other thing I will say in this study, we're asking you know, these questions of why are we happy. And, and so to Sydney siders, I'd say we're very happy because uh, Matt, one of the guys filling the survey, he from Tregear Heights had said, and he, he um, finished his response by saying, waking up each day knowing that I don't live in Melbourne lifts my mood on a daily basis. So, <laughs> so I thought we're even happier than, uh, than the rest of the country. Okay, well, important to sort of define what we mean by happy. So, Ross, can I ask you, first of all, to tell us what you mean when you talk about happiness? Well, that's a good question. I, uh, as uh, you said, wrote a book about happiness a year or two ago, uh, and I'm not the only one to have written a book about happiness. And then one of my great heroes, Hugh McKay, wrote this book, wrote his book, which he called The Good Life, attacking all these books about happiness. So I got a bit defensive, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought that there wasn't, there was very little about what he said that I hadn't said in my book. It's just that I called it happiness and he didn't like that word. Happiness is a word that can mean whatever you want it to mean. It can mean, and often does in some research, just mean sort of mood. Uh, you know, aim, aiming to sort of make life one long laugh. Basically, you seek out all the pleasurable emotions and you do your absolute darndest to uh, avoid anything that's, uh, that, uh, that involves pain. Well, that's not my definition of happiness. That's just a sort of hedonistic attitude. I'm not on about that. Um, what I'm on about is, in fact, my definition of happiness is Hugh McKay's definition of uh, the good life, which is about getting satisfaction out of helping people and uh, believing that you're making a contribution to the world and all that kind of stuff. Mm, okay, I, I once heard Hugh McKay 
begin his talk at the Happiness Conference in Sydney by saying, I want to talk about sadness. Uh, I thought, is he here to spoil the party or, or what? But in, in a sense, he was saying, happiness is sort of meaningless unless it's, we put it up against other aspects of life, which certainly will inevitably involve uh, disappointment, failure, sadness of some sort. So, Turkey, you're, you're a big into the happiness conference. Can, we, can you tell us what you mean when, we say, when you say happiness? Well, actually, with the happiness conferences, there's a lot of uh, presenters um, who have many different definitions of happiness. A French uh, philosopher, Henri um, Bergson, said that, you know, philosophers like to keep it vague because we all like to sort of define it differently. And it's interesting, the, the OECD uh, uh, report, because, I mean, that's sort of based on um, economics, on external factors and so forth. Yes, we've got nice city, liv livable cities, uh, lifestyle and so forth. Uh, but there's this sense of um, a more enduring happiness or um, Aristotle would have called it, called it eudaimonia, this sort of genuine happiness that through the tough going as well, which we're touching on, you know, the sadness and so forth, that through all of that, there's this sort of ongoing, enduring sense of contentment, satisfaction, um, a serenity of being able to deal with uh, the stuff of life. I think uh, Michael Lunig, who was uh, speaking at our conference just recently in Melbourne, the happiness conference, you know, sort of uh, mentioned the fact that, you know, sort of the happiness that comes when you go through the trials and tribulations and all the suffering and come out humbler and, uh, you know, sort of a wiser person. And I think there's that sort of sense of uh, happiness as a journey as well. Mm. Uh, we get questions on the floor. You can uh, text them in, SMS them in. Uh, we have one here that I'm going to touch on. Uh, the US Constitution talks about the pursuit of happiness. Is happiness, this, the question is, is happiness something we pursue or is it something we stumble on? And I think part of that question, Mark, is if we pursue it, is it likely to be elusive? Yeah, I think it can be elusive with a pursuit. Ours, our happiness in this country is not written into our Constitution, but it is in the first line of our national anthem. We're told to be rejoice, well, Australians, all of us rejoice, so whether we want to or not, we've got to rejoice. And, uh, and so we, we do our best. Um, I think that when it is pursued, it, uh, and particularly the definitions that I think most people would take as happiness, it does tend to, well, I, I see three problems with it, Tem tends to be a little bit temporal. I mean, even that, that OECD study was saying, are you happier more than you're not happy? And so that means that almost half of the time you can be unhappy and you're still counted as, as happy. You know, 51% I'm happy. So, so, so I think it's a bit too temporal. Um, I think that those definitions in terms of pursuing it just with the good life that we go for here is also perhaps a bit too situational. And, and this is what we found in our research, asking Australians, are you happy? Why? Back to you know, the landscape, it's great, great weather. You know, what about when it rains? Um, the lifestyle, the community is great. What about when you're disconnected from the community? Or people say um, uh, the, the freedoms that we enjoy. Well, there are some social fragmentation going on. So, so it's a little bit, I guess, situational. And is there anything a bit more lasting? And, and the other aspect is a bit too superficial. So most people will define happiness as success and achievement in life. And, and I think those elements show that if we're just pursuing it in that traditional sense, it's perhaps not a true and lasting and, and fulfilling one. Yeah, now, Ross, you've, um, you've done a lot of thinking about this. That study that people are referring to, and you have some questions around the study, so putting that to one side, though, the study itself is measured on things like jobs, income, so employment, income and health. Are these the right measures to be thinking about? I, I imagine you'll say there are other things. You, I know you talk about relational lens and, and thinking about economics as it relates to that. Well, I do. But if you were... I mean, it's, it's certainly true that uh, some of the most unhappy people in any society are the ones who are unemployed, who want to have a job and have had no success in finding one. Uh, they're particularly unhappy. They're unhappier if uh, all the people around them have got jobs. If they live in a suburb where everybody else is unemployed, it's not quite so bad. Uh, but uh, that's, that's certainly true. Yeah. And tell me about the, the factors that you would uh, want to talk about beyond those, those sort of economic oh, yeah, measures. Yeah. Well, um, I think, you know, all those material things are important, but... The great mistake that I think we make, economists make, politicians make, business people make all the time is to think that these material aspects of our life 
uh, are really so important that there's not much else and we should sort of organise government policy so that we maximise uh, economic growth and efficiency and so on. Uh, I think that's absolutely crazy and that much of the satisfaction we get, I think people do get a lot of satisfaction out of their work but the other big thing they get satisfaction out of is their relationships and uh, ro the relational aspect of our lives, the social aspect, even the spiritual aspect of our lives is very important. And uh, if we don't have that, we're not likely to be happy in any genuine sense, I don't think. Turkey, when uh, Ross talks like that and Hugh McKay writes his book, most of us kind of have a sense that they're right, that there's, there's something good about what they're saying and our best moments we see, we have yeah. clarity around that, but why is it so hard for that message to sink in? Because very often we live as if the opposite were true. This is true, because I think it's coming back to the pursuit of happiness, you know, this notion of, you know, sort of pursuing happiness, which is a bit obsessive compulsive and... Um, a bit fanatical, uh, out of a sense of desperation. I mean, it is true that our natural tendency is towards happiness, which is maybe why we talk about it so much and maybe why our conferences have been so successful. Uh, we all want to be happy, but, you know, what happens when the chocolate cake runs out or the economic boom, you know, sort of ends and, and so forth, that if we're re relying on things to be the uh, on the externals, then uh, happiness is going to be dependent on... Uh, you know, sort of things that are transient, that are, that are not lasting. I mean, we've just got to look at history and, and know that. So that um, it's, uh, you know, to actually get a, a sort of genuine sense of, of contentment, it's very difficult. I mean, I always say to people, I'm very content until I go into a shopping mall and then I, suddenly I want things I never wanted. I mean, look at me, do I need, no. So, you know, it's half price, it's only today and whatever. So this sort of desire get, overcomes this sort of genuine, you know, sort of, uh, sense of inner contentment and so forth. So according to the Dalai Lama, you know, we're all, we're all pursuing this happiness. I mean, not just humans. I mean, look at animals. We all want. But whether it's in the temporary pleasures or whether it's something ab about, you know, developing a more altruistic uh, sense, uh, well, physical, emotional, spiritual well-being and, and this sense of, you know, being a good person in society. You know, this, um, you know Augustine called it a truth-given joy. In, in a Buddhist context, we'd say, well, that, that joy is innate. It is our true nature. It is once you get rid of all the rubbish, all the debris of all the sort of negative stuff of the mind and all the negative emotions, then you really get to this truth-given joy. Now, Mark, uh, Dan Gilbert, who's a professor at Harvard, said something like this. It was, he says that 90% of our happiness is bought with the first 10% of our wealth. Uh, <laughs> And there's this sense that a lot of the things we might acquire have a bit of a buzz for a little while and then it drops away quite quickly. Mm -hmm. I think someone said recently, a BMW, they worked out that you get a brand new BMW, the buzz you get from that lasts about six hours or something. <laughs> yeah, you'd hope it would last a few weeks. Uh, but, but, some, but does that match with the sort of research and observations of people that you make? Yeah, it does. Uh, and that's the temporal nature of, I think, our pursuit of happiness here. And... and but also, an aspect of it is not only is it temporary, but we tend to um, feel less satisfied even in our material things if the bloke opposite or down the road has also got those things or indeed better. And the point that Ross made, you know, people don't feel as bad about this situation if others are also in that context. Or if someone is far better off, they don't even feel that good about themselves if people are better off than they are in their area. And so this, this comparison and this temporal nature to it, I think, is part of the challenge. And that's what, you know, the last few years has brought. That's probably why we're saying we're less happy. Not only is there less security and people are uncertain, can I maintain this lifestyle or what, what's next, but there is just greater access to see what everyone else is getting. And, and, I mean, the internet and the technologies of today and the social media, we suddenly see everyone else's perfect life portrayed before us on Facebook, not realising that they've airbrushed their photos just like we were doing the same to ours, and everyone's putting up a facade, but nonetheless it actually doesn't create community or social interaction, but actually can have an, an impact in diminishing it. So I think that the last few years have created some things that, in a sense, have, have, have frayed some of that sense of, of well-being, and you know, we're starting to see that more now. Ross, what, Ross, what is... You've written about the hedonic treadmill. This is related to what we're talking exactly. about. Exactly. What does it mean? What it means is that um, we do have this 
very deeply held belief in most of us, which can be revved up by advertising and is also revved up by TV programs and uh, films which really show you people who live perfect lives. They All their children are good-looking and... Uh, their houses are always tidy. That's the thing that makes me inferior, <laughs> feel inferior, because my house is never tidy. <laughs> and uh, you think, well, you know, and there is a, a kind of yearning there. And we have, and advertising plays on a belief that if only we got one more thing, if only we got one more pay rise. There's studies show that lots of people work out that if, if uh, only I could, uh, my, I could increase my income by 5000 a year, that would make me happy. Well, it never does, because when you get the 5000 you get used to that very quickly, and you aspire to another 5000 And then the next time an interviewer comes along, you, you tell them the same thing. People tell interviewers that all the time. Uh, even while the whole population's... In, income is increasing. So, no. Yeah. Uh, Turkey, I want to ask yeah. you about this, because I think we can draw some distinctions between some of our, our understandings of happiness here. Um, in the West, at least, happiness is generally linked to feelings of delight that, that come and go, we accept that, and that's part of its beauty. But in, isn't it true that in the Buddhist understanding of happiness, it's less about emotional fluctuations and more about the absence of emotional highs and lows. There's a sort of uh, equilibrium that's being this is Yeah, sure, there's a sense of equanimity. Actually, delight's wonderful. I, don't, I think we don't do enough of it. We don't do the rejoicing, you know, enough. And it's this sense of uh, a matter of how we work with our mind. You know, um, Mathieu Ricard, who's seen to be... Uh, he was dubbed the happiest man in the world. He's a French monk. And... Um, <laughs> You'd sort of want to, if we want to be happy, we'd sort of want to do what he did to get happy, which was thousands and thousands of hours of meditation. And uh, then they tested his brain, you know, did the, uh, the neuroscience on his brain and he sort of went off the scale of happiness. So he's sort of like, I'll have what he's having. Um, he's also been able to uh, override the startle um, response in an in a experiment. Because it, you know, so only person I know can do that. So this sense of... Um, uh, yeah, stuff happens in the world, but how we experience in that is is a result of our own sort of mental attitude, our mind, you know, how what we bring to it. And so this is where, I guess, in the Buddhist context, definitely, but also, you know, we have the Christian meditation tradition or all traditions, contemplatives of all traditions, to actually say, well, to to achieve that, it's a it's an internal job. It's not out there. It's inside and uh, that we need to put the hours into meditation just like athletes would put into, you know, sort of excelling, you know, the 100,000 hours or 10,000 hours, is it? whatever they have to do to become excellent in their, um, in their chosen field and it's sort of like the same with meditation. Can I jump in there to say that th there's a difference though. The Christian meditation, for instance, is calling on something from outside rather than within. And there's a person here who's written a question... Uh, Buddhists are looking for happiness in detachment from things. Uh, is that not the case? And then how do you find a happiness that acknowledges both an engagement with life, but what you're, you would argue for, detaching at some extent? Actually, there's no detachment, really. I mean, there is a sense of going inwards isn't a detachment. I think when I first discovered Buddhism, I thought, what, what use of Buddhists? They just sit on top of mountaintops and meditate. You know, what good is that to the world? I had a very naive idea of, of what it is, but you actually find through that, through being able to develop um, through meditation, attentional skills, cognitive skills, I mean, it should be taught in all schools, um, emotional balance, a sense of equanimity, actually you become more engaged. So there's more a sense of engagement um, with the world and, uh, you know, sort of, with and focus on others, you know, sort of, what am I doing? So I guess you spend time with yourself, but then the engagement with others how am I being of benefit to the world? You know, what is my action? What are my actions are I taking? So there's a, a, a sort of, um, I think, Ed Dina, who was also who's a happiness expert, was talking at our conference about the sense of social well-being, 
that should be on that OECD, <laughs> or at least on the national index, you know, how do we measure social well-being? And that people who are happier have better social relationships. They, um, they tend to marry younger, stay married, and uh, just m greatly more content with, with life, um, and live longer. So the relationship with health and, and lifespan. So Mark, um, perhaps your perspective on this. The biblical narrative certainly calls for engagement with all of life's emotions. Uh, weep with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice, we're told. Um, and you know, Ecclesiastes famously talks about a time to, to laugh, a time to cry, and those sorts of uh, connections to what we're talking about. Doesn't a fully engaged life in, in mean connection with all those emotions? Yeah, I think it has to, because if we're just doing an above the line, below the line constant analysis, I'm feeling happy now. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're recording a diary, I'm feeling happy. Oh, I'm feeling sad because this thing happened or someone just cut me off on the road. If we, if we do it like that, and that's what some of these studies, including that OECD one, was measuring, a state of happiness in any particular time, then the fact is things rust, things break down, bad stuff happens, we're going to end up with a a feeling that you know, life was unfulfilling and no wonder for so many people governing their life on that index, um, life is a profound disappointment. And that's, that's the sad reality as people perceive that, whereas the fact is that there has to be a way of actually, I mean, you know, biblical text saying rejoice when you uh, suffer trials of many kinds. So there has to be a way of actually rejoicing or, or finding good in even these negative things. So this scale of above the line, below the line has to yeah, more. well, you picked up on something there that's very counterintuitive. So Jesus sort of talks about things like blessed or happy are the mm -hmm. poor in spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, that's quite countercultural. It, it is, and yet it's a message that, that people want to, want to grasp. But we ran a study in the lead up to Easter. Just, we put down a lot of statements of, of Jesus and other religious leaders, and we said, you know, which of these are from Jesus, which aren't. Uh, one of them that sticks in my mind, we had 8% of Australians said that Jesus' final words were, such is life. Um, so, <laughs> a, bit rusty, a bit rusty on the Ned Kelly, Jesus sort of yeah, thing. Yeah. Um, and, and I was quite disappointed to see that a quarter of Australians believe that Jesus Christ lived, we gave multiple choice options, in ancient times BC, uh, before Christ. <laughs> so, some historical illiteracy along with the biblical one. But... One statement that more than half of the population, general population surveyed correctly attributed to Jesus was his famous statement, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. And, and I think that's the sort of statement that mm. Aussies still have a connection with because it's what they want. That, that fullness of life, not just this happiness in a sort of superficial, temporal, mm. external thing, but a, a true embracing of, 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 of an abundant and full life. Yeah, I've got a question from the screen which says, if selflessness leads to happiness or a fulfilling life, what prompts selflessness? And I think implicit in the question is, do we need something that grounds this sort of way of thinking uh, beyond ourselves? Ross, do you want to have a Well, I'm sure all Christians uh, would believe that. Um, but it can... Um, uh, I mean, I think it can also come just from our natural... Uh, instincts, uh, you know, why, why do, what, what, what exactly is the incentive system that causes the mothers of babies to worry so much about those babies? Well, I don't know, they just do. Uh, so I think that there are plenty of things around us, the example of others and so on, that uh, prompt us to worry about other people. And in fact, um, you know, I think if you pursue happiness, you won't find it. You find it when you forget about being happy and you focus on other people's happiness. And happiness is something that you kind of wake up one day and think, gosh, I'm happy. I hadn't been thinking about it, but now you mention it, I am. Uh, back, back to work. Now, we, um, we hear a lot, and many of us have experienced this with friends or personally, that there's a that depression and anxiety are on the rise. Could it be that in, in uh, the West, sort of shrugging off faith, uh, some level of spirituality or belief in God, is part of, of this uh, problem that we find ourselves in? Jerky, do you want to have a go at that? I don't know if that's the cause of depression, but definitely having some sort of spiritual belief, having some faith, whatever label people want to put to that, 
um, does lead to the sense of focusing on, on a, a others more than self. And I think it comes from our innate sense of love and compassion, that that is our nature, that it is who we are. You know, the studies on uh, compassion is sort of looking at evolutionary, like where does compassion kick in? You get to the human and we're perfect at it. You know, any time there's a disaster, we see that sort of compassion and Australians are amazing at giving at times of disasters, worldwide disasters and so forth. So even to people that we're not related to, not just the mother-child relationship. So this is, you know, sort of necessarily uh, part of who we are and that's... The, that's uh, I wouldn't say, um, you know, just coming back to the selflessness, that, um, that that's, uh, you know, sort of... We have to have a strong sense of self, actually. It's a sort of a bit the opposite, a strong sense of self and inner resilience and, and, and with that, because we have to have self-compassion. You know, people talk about compassion fatigue and all of this sort of thing. We have to have that towards our souls. So I guess it's a thing of having a meaningful life because the opposite is if, if, you, if you think about depression and so forth, we tend to be isolated. Um, it's very, you know, that we disconnect from others. So it's sort of opposite of focusing on others. Another question from the floor. Jesus said, I came so that people might have life to the full. I think that's it. Life to the full it seems a good description of, of this topic. Uh, the question is, how does religion make us happy or not? I mean, it can certainly make us unhappy. But, Mark, you want to mm. suggest the, the contribution that a religious I, faith can have? Yeah, I, I think it has to be more than just an identity. Um, now, that's what we have in Australia. Back to the previous question, you know, are we, as we lose our connection with religion, are we losing a connection with happiness? Well, actually, the census results show that 7 in 10 of Australians identified with a major religion, 6 in 10 with Christianity. 61% ticks Christianity on the census form as their religion. And yet not even 1 in 10 of those will attend church or personally, in an in a active and public sense, uh, practice that faith. So I think um, as just a sense of identifying with a religion as, as some philosophy of life without the, the practice of it is fairly empty and probably not going to change lifestyle and, and attitudes much. And, and I think that's where Aussies are at. We haven't actually lost that connection with Christianity, but we, we certainly have lost any, any particular and personal practice of it. Yeah, well, there's been a lot of research in the States. So Robert Putnam's uh, research, for instance, um, Howard Koenig's stuff on health and spirituality and that sort of thing. And most of what they talk about is it's the actual engagement in a faith community that will make the difference rather than just an assent to an idea. Yes. Uh, that, that seems to be the key. Interestingly, Putnam said that even if you're an atheist and you go to church with your wife who's a believer, the, you'll have the, the impact will be felt as much on you as someone who says they believe but never goes. So the, it, seems, yeah. it seems that there's something very important about the actual engagement in the community. Yeah, when you ask people what they want, we do community surveys, what are you looking for in life, what are your priorities? It is, as you were saying earlier, some of your relational and social connection and engagement. They want to make a contribution. They want to uh, feel that you know, self-actualisation, that they're, that they're doing something more than just the day-to-day. -day. Well, uh, unfortunately in Australia, people have defined religion down to a spiritual dispensary. Christianity is if you need a spiritual thing, you go there. But all of those things, the relational, the community, the giving, the contribution, the serving, um, are, are part of church life, and, and I think that's been lost. Yeah, a question, another one from the, from the audience. Uh, is happiness the pursuit of ending suffering? Uh, perhaps for you first, Ross, and then you, Turkey. Well, no, it isn't. Um, I, and this is the point that Hugh McCain keeps making. Suffering is a part of life. If you didn't feel really bad when someone close to you dies, perhaps in quite dramatic uh, and unhappy circumstances. If you didn't feel bad about that for quite some time, then you wouldn't be human. And that is part of life's experience. That's part of life to the full. Uh, so happiness is not that. It, that is really hedonism. Uh, and, I, and I don't see any reason to believe that hedonism will give you any lasting satisfaction. Uh, the lives we lead will involve a lot of uh, periods of being sad for one reason or another. It, it, they, life involves failing at things. Failing is very important 
to becoming successful at whatever it is you do. Uh, it's all part of the package. And just trying to avoid the bad bits won't make you happy. Okay. Yes, well, actually, it's interesting with our happiness and its causes conferences because our um, abbot at my centre said it could have been called suffering and its causes, but nobody would come. So it's a marketing strategy. It's a sort of indicating the flip side that we, from happiness, happiness is to sort of, um, I guess I would define as, you know, sort of wishing others to be happy wishing others to be happy, which is based on this sort of love, and then the suffering, through suffering we develop compassion, we develop empathy, we, you know, sort of, and through our own suffering we develop resilience. I would say I probably also work with the unhappiest people, you know, the prisoners in a harshest environment who see what they've done, has got them where they are, they want to turn their life around and say, you've got to help me with my crazy mind because they've got the suffering but through that, they can see a way through to transform that. And I think that's, that's the journey we're all on. You know, we're all in the prison of our own mind, if you like. We're all on this journey to, to deal with the, all the stuff of life, the, all the sufferings of life, but also through that to grow and become fuller, rounder people. Now, Mark, um, you've got kids. You, when you think about what you hope for them in their lives... Mm. Sometimes you hear people say, oh, I want my kids to be happy. Hugh McKay always says, oh, that's, that's too limited. Uh, you uh -huh. Surely you want more for them than that. What would you say you hope for your kids? If that's not too personal a yeah, question. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Look, I, I hope that they can be resilient. I hope that they can ride the roller coaster ride of life with its ups, fantastic, and its downs, as we've all acknowledged. Life is full of that. And yet, you know, get through that in a strong way. And, and so it is about, uh, you know... Having, having that personal faith and, and being able to, to ride out those storms. And I think this is, if we look generationally, where from the best of intentions, the baby boomers in a, perhaps a parenting style didn't get it perfect in that they, again, for the best of reasons, wanted to give their children you know, every possible start in life. The, the Gen Y kids were uh, years back called you know, the, the bubble wrap generation, this sort of thing. You know? and, and so the most materially endowed generation ever, the most supported, the, most, the, the longest to stay at home, the most educated generation ever. But... The unintended consequence of that is that you can end up being raised and, and having a safety net, uh, having a safety net syndrome, that if things go wrong, you know what, there'll always be someone there to, 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 to sort that out. And I think that that doesn't develop that resilience, that strength, that, that ability to get through the downs as well as the ups. So hopefully, and certainly we see it more, that parents are uh, realising that the suffering pain and the challenge is a part of life, and it's through the struggle that you actually build the strength to, to, to thrive. And I'm going to get a Final comment from each of you in a minute on, on this. But I want to ask you, Mark, first of all, the Christian faith calls for, in a sense, a laying down of your life in order to pick it up. Uh, how does that relate? It, sound, it doesn't sound all that encouraging, but what does it mean? Well, it's, it is ironic and it's, and it's counterintuitive and the very person we were talking about who said, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full, was the guy who got crucified, the guy who, who had the, 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 the nails put through his hands. And so, and so that, that is the person that we follow you know, as, as, as you know, Christians. And, and so it is, a, it is an anti-hero in a sense. It's not the, the, the iconic person who had everything in terms of um, uh, happiness as we would define it there. And that's, that's, if that's the master, then that's the follower. And, and I guess that's Therefore, you know, the nature of life. I remember some years ago that um, campaign that the church has funded, um, Jesus All About Life, ads that were put on our TVs, you might remember them, and the, the opening line said, hey, Jesus, thanks for, for sunshine, but what about sunburn? You know, and it went through the, the, the various elements of life and why do the good things have to come to an end? And I think profound questions in that. And we want the sunshine, we don't want the sunburn, you know. But, but uh, I think through that and through that journey and with, with that, that faith, um, I think that, you know, that's where you find the, the full life. And Turkey, just briefly, a final comment on... Oh, I want, to, I want to quote Michael Lunig again, actually. Mm. Um, so this is my favourite from his short notes from The Long History of Happiness. Come sit down beside me, I said to myself, and although it doesn't make sense, I held my own hand as a small sign of trust and together I sat on the fence. So the sense of taking time out, if you like, laying down the life to, to move, spending a life in contemplation and in meditation, um, that through that, having deep spiritual connection, it's sort of what unifies us across all spiritual traditions or none to really get to the essence of things and then bringing that back out to engaging 
um, with the world. And certainly in my tradition, that's what's been the history. And through that, developing not just, you know, a sort of level of happiness that the OECD might measure, but a, a flourishing beyond what we, what we um, think of as happiness. Just an incredible um, uh, sort of being able to really engage in the, in the world fully uh, with a happy mind and, and being able to really benefit others and not suffer in that, in that, um, in that context and leading a more meaningful life. And Ross, a final word of wisdom on happiness from you? Well, I think that um, a big part of uh, the good life, a big part of leading a deeply satisfying life is about finding meaning and purpose in your life. And uh, I, don't, I think that people do, who don't find much meaning and purpose in their lives, I can't believe that they would be happy uh, all, that, all that much. Um, now, uh, uh, spiritual belief uh, is what gives many people meaning and purpose in their lives. I happen not to believe that it's the only way to meaning and purpose, but meaning and purpose is what we need to be need, need to be on about. I think uh, it's certainly what I want in my life. Thanks. Sir. These are intriguing, uh, fascinating questions. We could talk a lot more about them. Thank you to the people who've been texting in their questions. Apologise to the ones we didn't get to, but they, but they really did help the discussion.